All right. So this is Evan with StandUpPaddleSurf.net. It's been a while, um, but coming back with top notch king of the hill, Dave Kalama. Big time, um, everything in the ocean, windsurfer. Kind of, you've been on the leading edge of pretty much every major ocean sport thing for the last few decades. And then now it's um, foiling, wing foiling, downwind foiling. So I just wanted to catch up with you and gain some, you know, knowledge because anytime I talk to you and I just bought the new E3 um, board, which is awesome. And anytime I talk to you, it's always like, oh, I wish I had that recorded. So thank you for taking the time and, and, and doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning. Hello to you, Evan, and all the listeners. And uh, yeah, stoked to have a chat about anything surf, board, wave riding, you know, I'm like many of the listeners, I love chopping it up when it comes to any kind of water stuff or design stuff. So uh, stoked to be here and mm-hmm. get into it. You, okay. So all right off, the, I'm, I'm curious because I was watching you as the, the viewers, they don't see this previous, but you're what kind of walking around and, and like right behind you, what is it, that thing behind you with the tennis ball? I mean, what is that? It's, it's a kind of vertical board rack. Oh, you know, so the boards would stand in it like that. And I just put the tennis ball. So while I'm, cause it's metal bars or carbon tube. So I put the tennis ball. So when I'm shoving it in, I don't shove the end of it right into the rail of the board. So okay. the tennis ball is just the bumpers to the entry point to the rack. It's, you know, your place reminds me of like um, in back to the future, you know, doc Brown, he's, he's got all this, but you're like the doc Brown of like water sport stuff. Cause he had all kinds of stuff all over is kind of amazing actually yeah I'm, I'm working on my doc brown hairdo right now so i'm trying to play the part <laughs> you're doing a good job you're doing a good job um okay so if we can start off maybe just with that e3 board because I, I i bought your initial one you know that first shape custom that thing was bomb proof man i mean that thing is like so solid that i really only had to do maybe a couple small repairs because i banged it like i dropped it once and, and so on um but then after my friend bought the the e358 i was like you know what i gotta I got get this and i just bought that 60 and and it's like wow this is this is way better but like why and how and so on can maybe if you can just kind of give some some tech specs or like why it's better or how the progression worked or kind of what you're thinking in regards to construction or design all of it yeah all of it all right construction wise most of that is left up to um, Frank at the Kinetic Factory, who runs that in Vietnam. Um, okay. he's, I rely a lot on his expertise in terms of construction. While I know how to build my own boards, um, I don't actually build out the customs. Um, nobody would want to pay for my level of craftsmanship, but it's adequate to test prototypes and stuff. So I've, I've got a, a guy in Haiku, Dave Peterson, who's been building boards forever. And actually, I met him back in when I used to windsurf for Jerry Lopez back in the 80s. So I've known Dave for a long time. He's been building boards forever, and he's quite good at it. Um, but in terms of the, of the E3 uh, production model, um, yeah, it's, it's a full high-density sandwich that we kind of learned or evolved from the windsurfing um, construction back in the 80s, too. Um, so while that might be new to people in the surf industry, maybe not so much anymore because it's been around, but uh, a lot of that came from windsurfing in the 80s and trying to make them strong and stiff. And there was so much stress demand put on the boards back then, we had to come up with a better way to make them lighter, make them stronger, kind of the stronger, lighter, cheaper mm-hmm. motto that everyone's chasing, uh, even to this day. But um, yeah, so a lot of that original technology came from windsurfing. Um, to get the real specifics of how much glass in between the core and the sandwich material, how much outside the sandwich material. Um, I, I lean a lot on, on the Kinetic Factory for their expertise because they not only do my boards, but they do Jimmy Lewis and Alex Laguerre's um, Go Foil boards. And basically all, all the boards are brands that you associate with really high quality probably come out of the kinetic factory so they're really good at what they do and just like my inexperience or inability with technology 
I lean on them for their advice and uh, expertise. You know, the, the finish looked like, I mean, it looked beautiful on this one. It didn't look like, a, I don't know, to me, and I'm, I'm not super expert, but it looked like one of those ones that would come out of like rap horse. But, you know, they were just it was just so pretty. And I was like, well, this don't look like a like a production board. It 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 looked like it popped out of a you know something high tech. It's been an ongoing learning process for me, and a little bit for them mm-hmm. trying to figure out what I want and and looks and and construction and finishes is sort of what you're speaking to. Um, so it's been an ongoing learning process for me because a lot of finishes be it painting first and then sanding and then glossing um, add a lot of weight they look fantastic but they add a lot of weight with those extra processes so you know we keep trying to figure out what's the lightest kind of and yet still get a a good looking finish to the board and that's always an ongoing because it's it's a constant state of compromise what what are you willing to give up to get the weight or whatever it is, you know, you're always having the balance strength and durability versus weight and cost and things of that nature. And sometimes we kind of get it really right. And sometimes not so right, but everybody has different, um, they sort of set their value differently for different aspects of construction. And so that's why two companies that might make a really similar product ultimately have a uh, different weight, different strengths is because what's most important to the guy making the decision. Um, is it weight being super high uh, of what you prioritize or is it durability and, and something's always got to give to get the other. Uh, so it's a constant state of, of learning what makes the most sense, what my customers like uh, great feedback from, from people like you really helps because as, as, a person or as an individual with my own likes and, and priorities, I kind of could care less how it looks. Um, durability is not that big an issue for me because I take good care of my board. So lightness and, and the design and how it functions is way higher priority for me. But, you know, the boards aren't costing me as much because I'm building them myself. But when you're spending, you know, 18, two grand for a board, you really want that thing to last. That's a lot of money, you know? So I've got to kind of hit these marks that are more important to people that have a different set of priorities and, and yet maintain my values and what I want to put into the board. So there's always a, a constant compromise on, on what you feel is best um, for your customers and yet still kind of maintaining what, what you're all about. You know, like in the when in the board's in the water and you're actually using it, then amongst those things, what would be the most important? Would it be the weight? Would it be the durability? What would be the most important to you? When it's in the water, it's just pure function. Um, weight, for the most part, not ultimately, but for the most part, weight for most people is just as important from the car to the water as it is from the water to riding, all right? And what I mean by that is when you pick the board up and it's in your hand and you feel the literal weight, um, people can kind of judge that and and calculate that in terms of performance. But in actuality, when it's in the water, while the weight is still important, um, lightness, isn't necessarily the most important thing Hmm. under the weight umbrella because what i've found is i've actually started making my own personal boards a little bit heavier again because the higher speeds i go the more weight i want on the board and it actually helps the board perform better when it's operating at at its high end sort of spectrum and the other thing is weight um in the water is much less noticeable than it is on land. All right, and then the function of the board and, then, and its characteristics start to play a much bigger uh, importance of how it feels versus the literal 
wait. And I remember a long time ago, Jerry Lopez told me, lightness of a board can make up for a bad design, but a good design will work at any weight. And at the time I was chasing weight because I wanted my board to be lighter. And, and he kind of enlightened that or shared that with me. And I sort of accepted it, sort of wrote it off a little bit. Um, but as time has gone along, I've learned that's very much true. The, the functionality of the board, I believe is way more important than the literal weight. Um, and if you can make a really high performance, high functioning board at the proper weight, not necessarily the lightest, but the proper weight that performs best at both ends of the spectrum, low end and high end. Um, because I mean, the faster you go, the heavier you want your board because what it does is it, sm it smooths out all the little quirks and jumps and bobbles that happen at higher speed because you're generating more lift with the foil and your board can start to feel nervous if it's too light. But at the low end, trying to get up out of the water, absolutely lightness helps that a lot when you're trying to pump it and, and swing weight is part of the equation, um, then yeah, lightness helps. But I don't want my board to get out of the water fantastically, but work like poop at the high end. So again, there's that compromise. You're always trying to balance and figure out what's best for the widest spectrum of uses. So when you're adding weight onto your boards, like how much weight, like a pound or are you talking about like five pounds or something? I'm talking about... Uh, approximately a pound to pound and a half for me. Like, so I got my board down to about 10 for a little while. And uh, oh, here's Leo. He wants it. Um, and it was, it helped getting up out of the water. But at the high end, I noticed, especially with the older foils that had thicker profiles, when they got going fast, boy, they really wanted to lift up out of the water. And the board was kind of like, oh, I don't like that feeling, you know? And so eventually I started building weight back in a little bit and, and sort of a, a way to figure out if you'd like to experiment with it yourself, get a, get a water bottle, fill it up with water, maybe a liter or, or a half liter, whatever you want, fill it up with water, salt water, preferably if you're in the ocean, fresh if you're in a lake or whatever, but fill it up, tape it to the nose of your board, somewhere between your front foot and the nose and catch a wave or catch a bump, ride it, get a feel for it, open the cap, let a little water out, screw it back on, try it maybe with a half bottle or however much you wanna experiment with and keep working your way down so the bottle has no water in it. And, and that will really give you uh, an opportunity to kind of feel what weight does. And the closer to the nose the weight is, the less of it you need to create a certain effect, right? So if I put the weight in between my feet, I'd need a lot of it. To, let's say two pounds in between my feet, I might only need half a pound to three quarters pound if it's up at the nose of the board to create the same effect. So that's kind of a fun way to experiment with weight. Um, on my toe boards on a big day, I'll screw down lead weight and, and make the board heavier. Whereas on a small day, I'll yank the weights off and, and it's more lively and fun. But that's because the the top end speed, you know, might be on a small day, kind of that 18 to 22, let's say 18 to 20 miles an hour. Whereas on a big day, you might be getting in between 25 to 30 miles an hour. And the amount of lift that's being created at that, that type of speed, you want more weight, you know. So weight is important, but weight doesn't always mean as light as possible. So... Mm -hmm. That's sort of my take on weight. What's your thoughts on on weight, more weight or less weight, or the positioning of it on a downwinder? On a downwinder, um, you know, like I said, my my boards were coming in, and I'm riding about a well at that time I was riding basically a six, five ten to six, and my I could get my boards to about ten, ten and a half. Now my personal boards, I'm more like eleven and a half, twelve. Um, and that feels pretty good and on, on really windy days or, or big channel crossings or something like that. I might take even one of my longer boards. So it might only be a half pound heavier, 
but the added length and having more weight in front of my front foot um, makes it feel heavier and thus smoother at high end. And because uh, when, when you're in a channel on a real windy day, the bumps are, are bigger, so you're attaining higher speed. You know, whereas say on a light wind day, maybe the wind's blowing 15 to 20, which would be considered light for Maui anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I might, I might actually take my little bit shorter board that has less fiberglass on it because getting up out of the water is going to be a higher priority and the pumping to stay up on foil um, would be a higher priority. So it, if you have the luxury of, of having a quiver, um, it, uh, it can really help your ultimate performance given what the conditions are. If not, you can kind of favor a light board and then add weight as it gets windier or the waves get bigger. Mm -hmm. If you're going downwind then, and I notice you have two boards, right? You have that, the, um, the downwind board that's really narrow, like 23 yep. half, 23 inches or so, which initially I, when I was talking, I was like, dude, I don't know if I can even sit on that. Like, holy cow, it looked so tippy to me, but, or, and you have the kind of surf wind shapes too, right? Can they both go downwind or is it pretty much only the downwind board? No, you, you can downwind anything, literally mm -hmm. anything. If it's a board that floats you and, and you've got a foil on it, um, technically it's capable of going downwind. Now, it's, really the question is, how efficient of a board can you get to make the whole process easier? Because it's very difficult to, to catch a, a wind swell and get yourself up on foil. And while you might be able to do that, now there's the riding of the swells, which is, really like a, a game of chess that you play with yourself because you're constantly making decisions. But um, the narrower boards, longer, narrower boards move through the water much more efficiently. So that makes it, and they have way better initial acceleration, which is a really high priority for me in, in designing. Um, so they make it easier to get up. Uh, the wider ones for some people, are a necessity because they need that stability. Now they still get up and, and the E3 design will make it as easy as possible for dimensions that are up into the 28, 29 inch category or even wider if need be um, because of their bottom design. So it really becomes a, a matter of what level of stability you need. Now you, you made the comment about a 23 inch wide board not seeming possible to even stand on it. I'm right there with you. The concept of it made no sense to me. Um, and it took me a while to get there. But the big breakthrough for me was realizing that most of my, and, and we're talking a couple years ago now, uh, most of my design um, priorities were on stability and paddling out into position, standing up. Once I realized that you don't have to stand up to get out in position, you, you negate the need to create that amount of stability. You only need paddle skills to stabilize, like, okay, so, you, so now a days, myself and all the guys I, I run with, we all paddle out sitting down or on our knees. So stability is not that big of an issue anymore. Once we're out in position, we jump up to our feet, you utilize your paddle and, and start to use that as your main stabilizing device. Um, and then when a, when a wave or a swell comes, you know, hopefully you have enough stability to catch it. And, and that catching on a narrow board makes it easier to get up. Once you're up and flying, boom, the party starts, you're on your way. But once I had that realization that I should stop designing boards for the paddle out, and more for the most important part, which is catching the swell. That was a major breakthrough design-wise. That allowed me to go from 26 inches wide down to 22, in some cases, 23, um, and made a huge difference in how well the board got up out of the water. And then once it's out of the water, does that narrowness help? Or is it is it pretty much just because in the water, it helps it to glide? Well, the, the only way it really helps is a a little bit of benefit in swing weight from side to side, not so much fore and aft, but for turning, 
with a couple inches less on each side, you can get more angle in your turns, which is kind of a cool thing because, you know, the, the more you can lean over without touching the board, the cleaner the turn is going to be. So there's definitely benefits to that. But but the real benefit is the ability to get up out of the water. If for some reason, a wider one was better at getting up out of the water. I'd be riding a, a wider one and take whatever the turning comes with with that. But it's not narrower gets up out of the water easier. And one of the benefits uh, just happens to be being able to get more angle in your turns. Mm -hmm. And then when once you're up, like how often are you coming down? Like, are you because you're Dave Kalama, you know, you've won the Moloka race many times and so on. Where what about for like near mortals or like novice kind of kind of people? What What do you think? Well, nowadays, I would say I can make it from getting up at Moloka to the boat ramp at Kavalui Harbor, approximately 10 miles nine out of 10 times without going down. Um, but in the early days, you know, if I got a five minute glide, I was stoked. You know, in fact, I remember my first five minute glide because I started timing how long I was actually up because your mind feels like it's forever and it's only 30 seconds initially. Um, but when I timed myself, when I got my first five minute glide, um, it took me, I think it was like seven or eight minutes to recover from it, just sitting there in the water because my legs were about to burst and huffing and puffing. And, um, yeah, you just, you're, you're overworking everything so much when you first figure out how to glide, but to get, you can kind of muscle it up to about five minutes, but then to get over five into that 10, 15, maybe 20 minute glide, you've got to start to figure out how to become more efficient. And the easiest way to do that is to straighten your legs a little bit. So you're using your, your skeletal system to support your weight, not your muscles. The more you engage your muscles to support, the quicker you're gonna get fatigued, right? And start to build lactic acid. So legs a little bit closer together, a little bit straighter. You can stand more relaxed, bring your upper body upright. Cause at first you're, you're down low and you're hunched over and you're trying to keep it all together. But the more you can relax, the more upright you can get. Um, the less energy that's going to take. And now you can go from, from five minutes to 10 to 20 up to a couple hours, you know, whatever it is. But uh, yeah, initially, I mean, nobody goes the whole way on their first try, nobody. But you keep increasing the length of your glide through your decision-making. You start making better decisions. Uh, you start making your decisions in a more timely fashion, meaning earlier. So you create a larger margin of error with every decision, which makes it easier to get it right. Um, and then placement on the swell, where to ride the swell to get the maximum speed. You start identifying swells that are going to help you keep going sooner. Just all, all those skills, um, as they develop, allow you to stay up on foil longer. What's the difference that you're seeing in how you got to do it on a on a stand up foil versus like what we used to do on those, you know, big stand up race boards or a one man canoe? So one man in stand up. Um, it's it's OK if you go down into the trough or the low spot in between the swell in front of you and the one you're on. Because the angle of, of the one you're on will keep moving you or pushing you forward. If you go down to the trough with a foil, you've essentially lost your, your mode of, of gliding. Mm -hmm. it's, it's essentially, and, and this is true for canoe and, and stand-up, but it's a, it's a gravity sport. You have to be going downhill. But the closer you are to the top of the swell, the more the angle allows you to be going down constantly, right? And so if you just go straight down because the, the foils will go faster than the swell to move, you're back in the trough. So the trick then becomes to go across it or turn so that you stay up on the top half of the swell or take that speed and launch yourself over the back of the one in front and get on the swell in front of you and get that downward slope again. Um, and there's a million possibilities <laughs> Um, within just that little scenario right now of angles you can take, speed you can generate that 
will help you place yourself to always be on that downhill kind of slide. Mm-hmm. So you ever feel like going on a one man canoe ever again? Going down? Oh, yeah, there? yeah. Oh, my, my son is just kind of getting interested in downwinding. And uh, so I've been taking him on my two man canoe. And that's a ton of fun to kind of familiarize him with what's happening out there, where to place yourself, how the swells work, what to be looking for, and all the basic fundamentals of what, of what downwinding is and being being able to identify uh, sort of the playing field that's open to you and then make decisions based upon what you see and where to place yourself. Um, so we're, we're at the very beginning of that. We, you know, we've probably only done three or four Maliko runs but every time we go, he's getting better at it and, and kind of starting to understand what I'm doing. Um, and that's my youngest one, Austin. Mm-hmm. My older son, he's a master at it already. But uh, my younger son is 13, you know, starting to establish the fundamentals of, of what's going on out there. And he wants to learn how to foil, too. So probably this next year we'll get him going and, and hopefully he'll start figuring out what's going on because it's a lot. It's not easy. It is by far the hardest downwind version uh, I've ever had to learn. You know, when I first jumped in, I was foiling waves as good as anybody at the time. I was still r- really competitive in downwind, unlimited yeah. sport yeah. downwinding. And I thought, you know, like everybody else saw the Kai video, I'm like, well, if Kai can do it. I can do it. And wow, what a humbling experience. I, I got my ass kicked, to uh, put it mildly. So I came in with my tail between my legs, very humbled. And it took me a while to get over that psychological beating I took the first time. Um, but I did eventually. And, and opportunities presented themselves to kind of work my way back into foiling and, and ultimately after a while back into downwinding but uh yeah if, even with all the right equipment the right circumstances the right board my first few times were yeah i mean i, I did a full maliko and i got two 15 second glides and one 30 second glide so if that gives you any idea over nine miles or a little more than nine miles how much time i actually i, I spent an accumulative time of one minute over a two hour, might have even been more, but at least a two hour paddle up on foil and gliding. So it was humbling. And did you, were you like, that was pretty fun and I learned something? Or were you like, oh my God, that was, what the heck? Oh, oh my God, what, 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 what's going on, you know? Because mm-hmm. um, I really thought I could do better than that. And I thought, wow, this, this might not be for me, you know, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to go one more time. And if there's, if there's no improvement, I'm out. But if there's any improvement at all, I'll, I'll stick with it and see what happens. And so the next time I went, I got two 30-second glides and three 15-second glides. I was like, boy, that's not the improvement I was looking for, but technically it was improvement. So let's go one more time and see what happens. And, and sort of the same thing, very small increments of improvement, but improvement nonetheless, which kept me coming back for more and eventually worked my way up but it, it took some time and it was uh extremely challenging so what would you say for like i'll just use myself as an example right i'm i'm 49 this 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 week for the most part i'm not i mean i'm novice at best um i weigh like 225 now after i broke my back i've been having a tougher time so what but i've i have downwind experience uh you know but i haven't gone in a long time and i live on oahu where we typically are in like 10 to 20 mile per hour winds if it's you know on the on the average so what like what would you suggest on how to go about learning this what gear would i use what uh, what's my progression to do what would you say okay so first thing i would say is get the largest foil you can get your hands on Literally, the largest. Like you Maliko know, and, 280? And yes. I was just going to say, that's the largest foil I know of. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're not a go-foil person, 
whatever your brand makes, get the absolute largest you can get. But the 280 is a great place to start um, the one that GoFoil makes. Next, I would get the longest board you can get, uh, even if it was eight or nine feet. Now, really? that's wow. okay. really on the long side, but maybe for your first time, literally mm -hmm. your first time, that wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility. You know, mm -hmm. ideally, I'd probably suggest something maybe seven to eight feet um, and a width you're comfortable with. Um, and I would say your first time should not be more than a mile or two. All right. Just just take a sort of a bite sized sampling because there's so much going on. You just your first one, you can't expect any real success. You just need to get out there, give it a few goes, find out what's going on, and just get familiar with, with what needs to happen. Okay? Mm -hmm. After that first time, you're going to spend so much time processing that experience. You are literally going to be learning more on land than you will have in the water. Because when it's all happening and stability is an issue and you're frazzled, it's really hard to process everything that's happening and then come up with solutions to those issues, right? But when you come back on land and you start to replay that tape and, oh, what should I have said? You know, we always come up with great responses to somebody's comments after we're not there anymore. It's the same thing with, with downwinding and being out in the water. Once you're away from the situation and you can process it and you can start to think of, oh, that one, I should, probably should have put more weight on my front foot and that would have helped the glide. And, then I would have accelerated more, which would have allowed me to come up on foil. Um, all those things that you're playing in your mind after the fact, you're learning. And so if you don't even know what the issues are because you've never gone, you just need to get out there and experience what's going on. And, and a mile or two is, is probably enough. If you can go longer, yeah, go ahead. You know, I'm not saying cap out at two miles. But if you're a fit person and you already know how to ride a wave on a foil, sure, sign up for three or four miles. But my recommendation is a mile or two is enough to dip your toe in the water, see what's going on, see what the issues are, and then start to process that. And now the next time you go out, you know what to expect. You have a, a better idea of how you'll respond to certain situations. You'll understand how much effort you have to expend in your paddle stroke to get up to speed, to have a chance to catch these swells and all those things. So first time, go out with no expectations or, or manage the expectations as much as possible. Go out with an open mind and just think, I'm looking for experience, I'm not looking for success, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then once you're familiar and you have a little better idea, now you can go out have a better chance at understanding what's going on, put more effort into it, be more comfortable in the situation because first time in any situation, I don't care if it's in the waves or flat water or giant wind swell, it's, you're nervous because you don't know what to expect. When you come back the second time, you'll know what to expect. You'll be a lot calmer. You can process a lot better because you're not trying to figure out not everything that's happening is new. Um, so you just need to get that first, that first time out of the way and then you can start to properly learn and figure out what's going on. So you would suggest staying on that um, Maliko 280 or like switch to like a GL240 uh, yeah. or something else too? Yes, I would recommend staying on that until you get up several times and you start to get a little bit of glide. One of the first things you'll experience um, once you do start to have a little bit of success is that this 280 isn't very fast. It's great at getting up but because it's, it's good at getting up, it's slow, mm -hmm. meaning there's so much lift at low speed, which is great initially, that same benefit is actually a liability as you start to need speed to get to the next swell and the next one. Um, but that doesn't even matter if you can't get up. So the first thing is get up. That's your highest priority. Now getting up's not an issue and you've learned the technique. Maybe come down to the 240 or the, G, yeah, the GL240 or the Maliko 200 or whatever it is. Still relatively big, but it's something that starts to move a little faster. And that'll start to allow you to get the speed to 
start connecting the dots, get to the next swell, but still have the lift to get you up out of the water. Because, you know, your first few times, like I said, if, if you get 10 second glides, 30 second glides, whatever it is, getting up is still going to be an issue, but a little more speed will help you start to figure out how to connect the dots. Okay. So like if you go on the other end of the spectrum, like where you guys are at, like what's your gear set up right now? So right now I'm using a 6.6 six by 22 and a half um, is my favorite board. I've also got a 6. I said 6.6, six, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my smaller board is a 6.2, 23, a um, little bit fuller nose, a little bit wider tail. Um, and I probably use a 6.6 six more. I use a 27-inch GoFoil mask or a 26 and a half, I, I believe, is what's available now. So for downwinding, uh, just real quick sidebar, the shorter the mast, the easier it is to get up out of the water. Um, but now the sweet spot's smaller also, right? But if, if you can't get out of the water, nothing else really matters. So I'd recommend, um, well, they make a 29 and a half. That might be a good place to start. But a shorter mast gets up easier and has less drag. You know, some of my friends, um, they only have, up into the 30s, 32 and a half, 36. Um, that's better than nothing, but those are much harder to get out of the water and there's more drag uh, once you're going. So 26 and a half, 29 and a half for the GoFoil, whatever your brand equivalent is, something of that mm. length. Um, foil wise, I probably use the GT1250 the most. It's really a great all around. It's got a great low end, still fast enough at the high end. Is that the biggest um, one? Is that the biggest one? That no, they no, have? That's, oh. I'd say medium, medium, small. Mm. Uh, probably closer to the NL160, but it has a better low end, and I think it actually turns better. Mm -hmm. um, so I really like that. It's a super versatile oh. foil. Now, on the windy days, I'm using the RF1150, uh, a little higher. Mm -hmm high end, um, still turns great. Um, a very good low end for how fast it is. Uh, so I, and I'm figuring out as I go along, I'm experimenting more with the low end of that foil, the RS 1150 and figuring out, I might be able to use that more of the time because it has a better low end than I might've thought. Uh, and I've, I've pretty easily gotten it out of the water almost every time I've used it. So I keep using it on lighter and lighter days to figure out if it's still usable for me. But that right now, um, that's kind of my higher end one, the GT1250 uh, is sort of my bread and butter. And then the GT190 when it's really light. Or if I go, if I go prone, the GT190 gets out of the water so well, it's so easy that it, it makes proning uh, much easier for me. I've gotten up on my smaller foils but the last time I used the GT 160 for proning, it took me like 15 minutes to get up out of the water. Whereas when I use the GT 190, you know, I'm looking at anywhere from 30 seconds to six or seven minutes to get up on foil. So anyway, yeah. GT 160 is my bread and butter. I'm using the 14 inch fixed tail from GoFoil. The longer the one or the shorter one? Uh, longer one. Oh. Longer one. The longer one actually turns really well, um, almost as good as the shorter one, but not as good as the shorter one. But what it does better is it pumps better and it kind of smooths everything out. So the the fixed 14 uh, longer one is, is absolutely what I use all the time for downwinding. And now I'm even starting to use it more in wave riding because it's so smooth in the turns. Oh, so you don't use the shorter 14 half that um, fixed. Um tail i've tried it i've tried it a few times and yeah for sure it turns better but it didn't get up out of the water as good and it, it didn't get that projection in my pumps like the longer one does um oh and another tidbit of information is that i use a front strap that's centered so if i'm and it's a nine inch spread between my screw holes so i can move a couple inches at least if not more within the strap Mm -hmm. to adjust to the situation uh, i don't use the back strap at all so that really allows me a lot of freedom to move my back foot um 
And if it's centered, then somebody can jump on my board. If they're, I'm a regular footer, but if they're goofy, the shop setup is the same for them and they can move within it. Um, now it doesn't, you can't leverage against it like you do when you're waiver riding when my strap is more six or seven inches wide. But for downwinding, I don't think you need quite the same leverage. And if you do, um, you kind of wedge up against the side of the strap, front or back, to create more leverage and use the strap more. But a lot of time, you know, I'm, it's loosely on my foot and I can kind of use it, but it uh, allows me to know exactly where my foot is. It allows me to freedom to move back to when I was saying getting your feet closer together, um, which really helps with your efficiency and, and longevity of your run. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's all I can think of right now. If you're on Oahu doing the um, like Hawaii Kai run, what would your equipment be? Uh, well, because I'm not super familiar with foiling it, I would probably start out with my GT 190, which I think is the, would be a, uh, 1450 in centimeters. Um, that's equivalent of like what in the like NL or GL, what would that be equivalent size? 190. To? Oh, 190, 190. 190. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's got a great low end for me. It, it's pretty fast for how good the low end is still turns really nice so that would be my starting point and then if that was really easy then i might go down to the gt 160 or 1250 same thing um but i doubt i would use my rs 1150 unless it was smoking wind over there um and speed would be a nice thing but a quick word on speed quite honestly um while i do love getting fast times I would say out of 10 runs, maybe one of them is centered around speed. Just riding the ocean and turning and trying to stay with my friends and cruising is so much more enjoyable than a speed run. Because if I'm chasing time, from the minute I start my clock until I stop it, I'm so engaged and so focused on every swell and just trying to go fast that I don't even know if I'm really having fun. I mean, of course I'm having some level of fun, but my clock or my watch is going to dictate how much fun I had. If I beat my best time, woo, I had a great time. You know, now I'm all stoked. But if I don't, it's a disappointment. And, oh, well, maybe I'll get it next time, right? And I'm not having as much fun. Whereas when I just go for like a surf cruise run, I'm enjoying the moment and each turn and watching my friends turn and we're just feeding off each other and having fun. And then, and the level of enjoyment in the moment goes much higher with just the amazement of riding the ocean and and kind of a never ending wave, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, And really the majority of time, that's my focus is just to go out and ride the swells and connect the dots and make good decisions and see, how little I can pump. And now I put my paddle on my back uh, with a strap. So paddling is not even an option once I'm up and riding. So that means my decisions need to be real sound. My pumping needs to be efficient. Um, And it's all those little kind of game within the game that I like to play. Like a lot of times I envision myself of mimicking old surf heroes, you know? So I might do a cutback like Billy Hamilton and just try and have a, a nice style, kind of a tall lean and the hands just right. And, you know, I might try and do some MR twin finny t- style turns on, on some swells. And it's just kind of a, a mentality of play, just, just playing out there and having fun in the moment. Um, and then seeing how little I can pump is another game I love to play, you know, and if I do pump, can I get away with one pump? Can I get away with two or three and minimizing that? Because what that's an indication of, of is of good uh, decisions and a good strategy of what my line should be. So all those little, little games that keep me engaged um, are really fun. Okay. So pretty much if you were, if you were here, you wouldn't use the RS as much because, because the GT no, lifts probably, a little bit faster. Well, I might use the RS. 1300 which is the next size up from the one i really like to use that has a great low end really good high end for how big it is um so that actually might be a really good option um Mm -hmm. to go fast 
But the only downside with that is it doesn't turn as well as the GT model does. And when I'm out there more for a turning run, I probably use or lean towards the, the GT uh, 190 because um, it's got the great low end. It turns fantastic and it's fast enough. Okay. What, what do you use in waves then? Uh, in waves, I've been using the GT 160 a lot. And now I just got the smaller version. Uh, I think it's the 130 mm. GT, uh, which is, you know, same size I used to use last winter, which was the NL 130. Okay. But the GT has a better low end, has a smoother turn, and combined with the fixed tails now, uh, in the ways I probably use the short 14. So, so do you ever time. use NL or GL anymore, or not? Not really. No. Oh, no. Okay. And the GTs and the RSs are so nice, and a lot of the guys on Oahu, uh, I think, are using the the is the 180P PNL. Yeah, PNL. That's it. Uh, because it pumps so well, it's got a good low end, but it's really fast too. And maybe over there, I'm kind of speculating at this point that that uh, really good pumping characteristic is higher priority and yet still really fast to, to get to that next pump. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm hoping to get over there before too long and do a couple runs with the Oahu guys and, and figure it out and just have fun. And what I'd really like is for some of them to come over and do a Maliko with us. I, I think it blow their mind how much fun it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that you guys have so much wind and, and it's just, you know, 20 miles per hour over here is a good day. You know, like, oh, get it, you know, take off work and try and do that. You know what I mean? Um, over here, 20 miles an hour, everyone's kind of humming and hawing. They're even going to go today or they get out their bigger foils. Still fun, though. I mean, my one of uh, Craig, one of my downwind buddies, we love going on the light days because it actually makes your skills better mm -hmm. um, with smaller bumps and fewer of them. You've, you've got to make better decisions to keep going. Um, it's more exercise, which I'm always game for. So I like that aspect, but the, the light days um, really develops your skills much better. You know, those perfect days that we get over here, you, you don't have to make great decisions because there's so many options in front of you. you. You can get most of it wrong and still keep going. Right. Mm -hmm. But on those light days, your strategy or your fundamentals have to be much better. So we like those light days when they do come because it makes us better down foil or downwind foilers. So pretty much GT is kind of your your go to these days. It's my go to. It's 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 the most versatile foil in the whole range. I feel, and I really love that versatility of knowing I I got the low end covered. Uh, it's still fast enough at the high end and the turns are just dreamy. So really love that wing using it in the surf a lot. You know, it's, if, if I could only have one wing for the mm -hmm. rest of my life, it'd be the GT 160. Wow. So, it, you know, that's so interesting because like, I know that you're, I mean, you're, you're super talented. So let's call it that, but you're like on the bigger side for most. Uh, most dudes. I'm not a small guy. Right. And, yeah, I'm I'm no spring chicken anymore either. Yeah. So a lot of these guys that are young that would just demolish me in small bumps where it's sort of fitness and, and technique too. Um, they would destroy me. Like up in Hood River, I got just demolished. I had so much trouble getting up on foil. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even want to admit how long it took me. But when I got up, nobody was in sight anymore. Mm -hmm. I was all alone. Over here, if we put them out in some big swells on a good, solid Maliko day, I guarantee I can run with anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying I'm going to beat everybody, but I can certainly run with them. I got one of the fastest times that I know of out in the big bumps. But big bumps is more about decision making and my weight um, works to my benefit. Oh. But in small bumps, my weight works against me and my level of fitness definitely takes me out of the race. So... Mm -hmm. There's different aspects of it and, and fitness and technique um, is a big factor in most downwind conditions people are going to run in. But when you start getting into the big open ocean stuff, um, weight's not necessarily a bad thing. So if we're over for like guys like me in, on Oahu and then I weigh you know, 20 pounds more than you um, and way less talented, then pretty much I'd ride GT then. I wouldn't be on the RS so much, yeah. 
Yeah, I think there's a GT twenty two hundred mm-hmm. that a lot of the the guys getting into downwinding have been using over here and really stoked on it. Mm-hmm. Great low end and still fast enough to kind of stay with the smaller bumps. What what so size that, would that be like? Would that be like an NL two twenty size or like kind of probably two twenty to two forty? Or or be like a GL two twenty to two forty, something in that range, I think. Uh huh. And you wouldn't use that one for surfing. You that one would be pretty much a dedicated kind of downwind, downwind. kind of wind. Downwind, okay. just to get up out of the water. Okay. Okay. And then, so maybe, maybe we, boat weight, you know, if, you, oh, okay. if, if that's what you had available, something like that might might be able to allow you to catch a boat wake or flat water starts. Mm-hmm. Is there an ideal like setup to go with your E3 boards, or pretty much whatever setup kind of because everyone's different and so on. Yeah, everyone's different and, and their objectives are different. You know, like some light, younger, prone guy um, definitely wouldn't want to use what I would use on a light wind, downwind day. Um, so to, to say one size is optimum, uh, th- there's just too many variables, too many personal objectives and what you want to accomplish. Uh, in it to to say one size fits all okay so if maybe if we can segue into the um the boards unless you had something else to add in to that last conversation because uh, i'm wondering on you know the progression we started off or you started off with the kind of more like uh rectangular shape right yep. and then yep. that you know i i liked it it was easy to stand on it first time i could stand on something short i'm heavy you know what i mean um but once yep. i tried once I tried the E3, I was like, okay, because actually in the, I was like, ah, I can still stick with this one. But once I tried the E3, I was like, oh, this is way better, easier to stand yeah. on, much smoother, kind of less sticky. Um, I noticed too yep. when the nose on my other one went real choppy, and the nose on the the first generation one will dip, then it'll kind of do this kind of move. But the E3 doesn't. It'll it might do it, and just it's just easier to balance on in general. Even on winging, like I took it, I'm, I'm riding a um, Quattro that's five eight, and that's a little bit hard because I mean it's the the volume. I mean for you guys, you'd be like, oh dude, you suck, which is probably true. Um, but you know the the you know it's it was hard to s- kind of stand up on and then, but I like the smaller because it gets out of the water faster. It feels smaller in the air, and yep. and the six zero. I don't know, man. It was like this is super comfy, man. And it didn't yeah. feel like it was holding me like I can't get this damn thing off the water. Like the other first generation um, 6.2 that I have would take more effort to get off the water. It, but this this one, it, it didn't. You know what I mean? So the elevator, which was the first one, the E2, the second one, which was just an evolution of, of the elevator. Um, elevator. I felt, like, I felt like the... Stability was really a high priority at that point in the sport because there were so many new people coming into it and the boards were so much shorter than anybody had ever experienced or, or thought about and even myself. Um, so I felt like I had to maximize every inch of length to create a stable platform and then work around that to incorporate features that allow it to get off the water or still go through the water. Uh, as efficient as possible, but given they were essentially shoe boxes, there wasn't a ton of efficiency associated with it, even though I did what I could. Um, and what radically changed for the E3 versus the E2 was uh, not just an evolution of that design, but a whole new concept of what I was trying to achieve. And that all stemmed from my pursuit of downwind prone foiling and and thinking, well, what I was thinking there was, okay, the stand-up guys have access to downwind foiling. Um, But at that time, proning was growing at a much higher rate. So I was thinking, boy, if I can figure out how to prone downwind and make it accessible to all these prone guys that feel that's not part of what's available to them, that's gonna open up downwinding to so many more people. So that's kind of started me on my quest to try and figure out what needs to happen to get downwinding 
so initially I just tried to take an E2 and change the dimensions of it, um, longer, narrower, and, and figured, oh, well, the design's good. And maybe it'll just work if I just change the dimensions. And it didn't. And I went through a lot of failure and frustration um, trying to figure out how to get this to work. And ultimately, I came to the realization. Uh, and then we're talking about a, a, a good year long process. I've been, I started working on this quite some time ago. Um, finally came to the realization that the E2 design is, is not it. I've got to start all over and really figure this thing out. And so I went back sort of to my experience with uh, traditional paddle boarding and paddleboard design and, and how efficient those seemed through the water. Now, given they were 12 foot, so that's, I'm chopping off six feet, seven feet of, uh, actually, no, it'd be six feet um, from those designs. So let's start with those because as far as I know, those are the most efficient uh, down in the water accelerators to catch bumps. Um, so I started to incorporate traditional paddle board design with a few foil board features so that uh, it, it didn't have any adverse effects. Real round edges everywhere actually suck the board down into the water while it might come off the water nice yeah. at speed, those curves are gonna suck back in. So I had to put some hard edges in a few places so that there was points of release so that the board wouldn't suck itself into the water but rather let go of the water and come back up. Um, and once I started down that path, I noticed, wow, okay, now we're making some progress here. Keep refining that. And the big breakthrough was actually the hand paddles. Um, once I could increase my level of acceleration, not just through the efficiency of the board, but through the power I could generate with my hands and, and what was you know, ultimately my source of power, um, when I increased that, that's when things started to click. And so sort of chasing that, I don't get to where we are now if I don't have to figure out and reanalyze everything that's going on. To get on foil, it's all about the acceleration. So all these planing features don't apply. And so that's when my thinking was more, say, from one mile an hour to four or five miles an hour, not from four miles an hour to 10 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, and so once that became my focus, I could, I knew what to do essentially. Uh, it was just a matter of adapting it to a shorter platform um, and incorporating a few things that, that worked in foiling. And I kind of equate it to going to the moon, which might be a bad comparison, but it wasn't ultimately about getting to the moon. It was the technology that was needed to be developed in order to get there. That's where the gold was. It wasn't actually landing there, although that's pretty cool. For me, it was like, okay, chasing this downwind prone thing, maybe a bunch of people do it, maybe not. Hard to say, you know, because it's so difficult. But what I learned about the acceleration process and that, that portion of foiling that happens from the, the time you decide to try and catch a swell to the time you're up on foil really enlightened me to a whole new set of design criteria, uh, which allowed me to come up with the E3 and, and, and sort of polish it and get it to work even better, um, which was pretty exciting for me because I don't think to that point anybody else had put that level of focus on getting their board out of the water. They were more focused on once out of the water. Uh, yeah, it needs to get out of the water, but, but it was, they were incorporating more design factors that I didn't. Um, so their boards, yeah, were just different. It, it, it just, it really changed my mindset and what my objectives were once I narrowed my focus and, and design to that initial acceleration which mm -hmm. allowed you to get up quicker and get up on foil. And so then I had just incorporated it across the board, what I had learned to stand up foil boards and, and it translated uh, regardless of what the width was. You know? 
Okay, because that's what I was wondering. So you started off on the um, on the downwind version, and then you're like, "Well, this is awesome." So let's put it these factors now into the sup wing kind of version. Um, yep. Okay. Okay. So, exactly. so on the sup wing kind of version, then where do you what do you think are the biggest kind of advantages to this new shape versus you know the the version two or version one? Well, it was basically, the, and. It seems unanimous in all the feedback I've got. That it's what I found for myself early on. But you're, as a designer, you're sort of kind of, your, your judgment's a little bit uh, subjective or objective, I should say, or tarnished because you, you want it to work so badly that maybe your mind isn't as open as it should be. But when I start getting feedback from people that I know are going to be extremely honest and they don't care if it works or not, they'll, but they'll tell me if it's better or not, right? Once I started getting their feedback combined with my own and validating what I thought was going on, there's no question these boards get up out of the water easier than anything I've ever tried. Um, and, and hearing that over and over again from people that are trying this design um, really gave me a lot of confidence um, that, that I was on track and I was achieving what I had set out to do. So the first thing you'll notice with these boards is if you're winging, if you're stand up paddling, if you're proning, they get up out of the water quicker than anything before them, which means you can catch waves that aren't breaking. You're up on your wing or you can go in lighter wind easier. And for stand up, it allows you to catch the wave sooner. So you have less critical drop to deal with because you're getting in a little bit sooner. So all those things to me make it easier. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's mainly getting off the water. What about, you know, I noticed also in the air, it seems to be, I don't know if it, it just seems to turn better, but I don't know well, how that works. That is less about the whole design and more about my math, meaning my dimensional placement of wide points, tail width, uh, chine size, um, my math on where I place the boxes, essentially kind of creating a, a very nice blend of all the ingredients so that they fit together well. Sort of like on a really good surfboard. You could have a great surfboard, but if you put the fins in the wrong place, it's not going to feel great. Mm -hmm. and, and vice versa. If you get the fins in the right place, but the design's not so great, eh, it works. You know what I mean? But when you get all the geometry of it, the wide point, the rail curve, the fin placement, the bottom shape, all those things combined and, and, and you put them together. Because um, it's one thing just to have all the ingredients, but if you don't combine them well, um, you, you're not going to maximize the benefit that each one has to offer to the design. So kind of feel like I, I got all the proportions of the math right. Uh, the design features fit well with each other and enhance each other. Um, they're not just there for a visual effect. Um, there's some secret sauce stuff that I might not go into because I'm <laughs> sure there's going to be other companies that uh, want to create the same style of board, let's say. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's there's some there's a few things that I'm sure they'll probably incorporate, but they don't even know why they're there. Um, much like some of the copies I saw of the E2, um, they they put a lot of features in their way, which showed me they didn't even understand why they were there. Because there's certain things, every everything in my design has a high level of functionality, or it's not there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not into bells and whistles. In fact, all sometimes I have a hard time even designing the boards I do because it almost appears as they are that they're bells and whistles because there's so much going on. But um, ultimately, something will stay in the design if it truly offers a lot of benefit to the performance. If it doesn't, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, so on the the range for the sup wing foil ones and then also for the down one ones like how did you um how did you determine that how do you categorize it how do people determine what's going to fit them best you know maybe you can explain some of that 
that's, that's a good question because another thing I did besides just the design of the board was I changed my mentality on how you decide which board is right for you. So to the uh, wing sucks. Normally, most people pick their length first and then determine their width um, to create a certain level of stability. And I flipped it around and said, well, why don't we first pick what level of stability we want and then pick our length within that? And so that makes the decision easier, right? So I basically created these different categories, 26, 28, and 30. Another way of saying it is not so stable, mildly stable, or really stable, all right? So once you figure out what category you, you fit into, then it's just a matter of small, medium, and large. So let's take the 28, for example. The 28 category comes in a 5.2, a 5.6, and a 5.10, all right? Small, medium, large. So once I decide that the 28 category is for me, I want the 5.6, um, and so my decision is done. If I need a lot of stability, it's the same process in the 30s or the 26, right? And now we're even adding one more category, the 24s, which is, I'm probably still going to call it a wing sup, but it's much more so just winging. Mm -hmm. People like my son who are 150 pounds and have more talent than any one person should have, could probably sup on a 24 inch wide board. And he does actually. So people like that will be able to sup it, but it, it's going to be a little more wing focus. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of the concept on choosing your size for wing sup. First, figure out your stability level, then pick your length. Uh, for the proning, uh, it's a little more traditional in that they're all relatively narrow. So you don't have to, you know, in proning, uh, stability isn't as big of a, a, a designing priority. Mm -hmm. So it's more of the whole design and the length. Um, and so there's a 6.5, which is the size that I would literally use. I always like to make a size within my design that literally is for me. That 6.5, 23 and a half, uh, would be a very easy board for me to stand up downwind or prone downwind. Uh, I can do it on the 6.1, which is the next size down, but it's more challenging. Uh, or the 6.1 is the one I actually use when I'm riding waves. It's a good fit for me there. Um, but a lot of my friends are using the 6.1 for their stand-up downwind size. There's a 5.9 and a 5.3. Um, my philosophy on prone wave riding is, I don't, the concept of catching a whitewater to ride a wave has never really sat well with me. Uh, you, know, you can blame that on old school philosophy, but I like the thought of catching a swell before it breaks. And so my prone boards are very much designed to get in early, really early. Uh, if you incorporate the hand paddles, you're catching waves that never even break. That's how well they can catch waves in some of the bigger sizes. Um, and most of the prone surfers I see, not all, are making turns such that my style of prone board would work fine for them. The guys that are hitting the lip, sliding in the white water, absolutely a little tiny board has benefits and, and is justified in using for them. And they're pumping back out the, the waves much more than what I do. Pumping for me isn't a high priority in the waves. Catching and riding is what high level for me. Um, so I'm not saying my boards are better than the little short ones that the guys are using four and a half to five foot. It's just a whole different sort of mentality or, or philosophy on, on what prone wave riding should be. I'm more about catching and riding, meaning catching, meaning really early or a wave that doesn't break or, you know, a little bigger kind of open carving as opposed to hitting the lip. So if that sort of, suits you or you want something that catches really easily, then my style prone board would work great for you as well as winging. Get up off the water super easy and early as well as downwinding. So my prone boards are, yes, it's what I ride in the waves, but the versatility of them allows them to be winged and downwind. And so that's kind of what I wanted to create in my version of a, a prone wave board. Okay. And then 
how do the leaders come into this? Like, how are you kind of interpreting leaders, um, especially when you're talking to people looking to buy in those categories? How would how would you well, kind of discuss with, that? With catching being very high on my priority list of design criteria, uh, buoyancy or volume really helps that and to achieve that design criteria. And so my boards are for prone boards, really high volume actually, but that's part of what allows them to catch waves really easy, to get up out of the water if you're winging or supping them, or downwind supping them. Um, Paddling back out is kind of a side benefit. You know, I don't really design for that, but paddling back out, they just glide through the water. Awesome. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the, I have higher volumes so that you can stand on them. I have higher volumes so that you can prone, catch downwind, wave super early. Um, and I feel that that added volume for the style of writing I like to do and a lot of people right uh, an adequate in terms of maneuver when I'm trying to do airs and bang the lip yeah I'm not going to try and tell you these are better than a little teeny four six thin low volume board but most people I know aren't trying to do that they're just trying to get in as easy as they can get to their feet as easy as they can and just have fun carving and foiling and so I want my boards to be hyper easy, hyper, just go out and have fun um, and make foiling easier for you. I mean, fo let's face it, foiling ain't the easiest thing in the world. So I I'm really focused on making it as accessible and as fun as possible. Okay. And then what about for the the crowd that's like 200 pounds and over? Like, what? how would you size them and so on? Because, you know, like for us, it's, you know, I got all these guys or ladies that are, you know, 170 pounds and they're on small stuff, but look at that. It's like, that ain't, I, mean, I can't even well, sit on that thing. You know what I mean? Saying it without saying it. That's exactly why my boards have higher volumes relative to most boards. Mm -hmm. They accommodate bigger riders um, and make it easy. You know, it, it really is that simple. I'm not a small guy. I kind of go between maybe a little under 200 to 205, 210 sometimes. And I need a board that has volume if I want to go out and catch a swell. And so my boards have that. Now, there's smaller versions for people that are lighter, for sure. But some of the bigger ones, you know, I'm thinking about designing boards for myself and guys like me. Because mm -hmm. not everyone's 150 to 170 pounds. But you need to, you need to have designs uh, that accommodate them, too. You know, so that's why there's various sizes. Mm hmm. Because, I mean, that's what we were talking about when I was trying to decide between that 510 um, and then the 60, right? And the 510 actually seems quite a bit smaller when I'm standing on it in the water, trying to maneuver around and so on. But I don't know. For me, preference, I like the 60s volume and stability. I didn't feel like I lost that much in terms of being able to, you know, once it's up in there and turn it and so on. But um, I don't know. What What are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, you know, um one of the most common ways to dictate volume has always been length and width and, and thickness to some degree, but people always have been afraid to go too thick, you know, because a thick stand up board, a thick surfboard always equated to lower, lower performance ultimately. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot of designers, I think carry that over into their design uh, sort of mentality for foiling. And, and I've tried to really check myself and not bring any preconceived notions to foiling when I'm designing. And so make it thicker. There's very mm -hmm. little performance um, compromise that comes from making a thicker board. It literally performs almost as well as a thin one, right? Yeah. And so by making it thicker, you get the benefit of catching easier. Uh, in certain cases, higher stability or better stability, um, which allows you to catch a wave easier, catch a swell easier, whatever the case might be. It means you're the fun of what, what we're trying to do is closer and easier to you. Yeah. 
when it's thinner and it's harder to catch, um, it might perform slightly better in certain scenarios. But if you can't get up and get on foil, mm-hmm. fun's got nothing to do with it. You, you're yeah. not having any fun. And, you know, back to the overall philosophy, I want my boards to really make foiling as easy and fun as possible. And so thus my volumes are a little higher because the performance cost for that extra volume is actually very low relative to normal stand up or surfboards. Yeah, I agree. I remember on the first one you were asking me, well, how thick do you want? I was like, dude, make it as thick as you can. You said, okay, I just dusted it off. (laughs) Sand it. You know, the thickest we can get. And you know what? That I don't feel any detriment to that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, but but it's it's hard to break some of those um sort of historic experiences from surfing or stand up, you know, on the water normal stand up. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to break some of those preconceived notions that you bring from those sports and apply them to foiling. They don't they don't translate yeah they don't acquire the same uh responses you know what i mean right and so right. you really have to let go of, of those historic preconceived notions and and start from uh, a totally clean slate yeah plus i figured you know on a stand-up you know we're, we're turning using the rails and and fins this one i'm not turning with the rails you know what i mean the rails out of the water so who cares but I don't know, maybe it does make a difference on some stuff, but I don't know. To me, I, I want it easy. I, I, I'm i older already. I don't I don't want it. I want it easy. Like yeah, golf yeah, clubs, right. you know? The, the board isn't the mechanism by which you turn. It's yeah. a platform to get on foil. So yeah. you want the board very much part of the equation when it's still in the water. But when it's out of the water, you want it to almost disappear as much as possible. You know, so it's a really broad spectrum you're trying to design for one thing on this side of the of the scale, getting up out of the water. But yeah, you know, once you're out of the water, you want the thing to be nearly uh, invisible or as small as possible. So, uh, it, yeah, I, I totally agree with you that the board rail obviously has nothing to do with turning and how it interacts with the water, like surfing or or stand up. So uh, couldn't agree with you more. Oh. What's the, um, are there any common questions that people are asking you in regards to the boards that could help people watching this that maybe we didn't cover? Well, uh, one of the most common questions I'm getting nowadays because of the increased interest in, in downwinding and they see the numbers of the boards we're riding 22 and a half to 24, their experience tells them that's never going to work because of a 28 or 29 inch is as tippy as it is, how the heck am I going to stand on something that narrow? Mm -hmm. And the answer is you're not for very long, quite honestly. (laughs) (laughs) Your paddle skills need to be adequate so that the paddle becomes uh, a major factor in your stability and having the skill to, to brace yourself with your paddle and getting out into position it's no longer a design criteria because you're either going to be kneeling or sitting down. So it takes that out of the equation too. So the reality is you don't need to stand on a 23 inch wide board very long if you're using it um, because the time you're standing on it is literally only going to be the time that you spend catching a swell or catching a wave. So we're talking a few seconds to a few minutes at the most, right? Not the 10 or 15 minutes it takes you to get out into position uh, for sometimes on a Maliko run, let's say. Uh, so that drastically changes uh, the equation of, of the whole scenario, meaning how can I stand on it? In choppy water, it's really difficult. Now, guys that are focused on getting up in flat water, typically they're going to be in, in literally mirror smooth water and it becomes very possible to stand on those boards 23 inch wide when the water's that calm because you're on bigger foils bigger foils create a lot of stability um, for you to stand on and the mass itself creates a lot of stability and so while they are difficult to stand on um, 
they are much easier to stand on than you would think. Doesn't mean they're easy, but it's definitely easier than you would think. And, and you would have to be moving for it to be easier to kind of stand on or like you're just even once you just kind of pop up and try to stand on and get your balance. What do you think? Well, that, that's the that's point. Once you start moving a little bit, mm -hmm. one mile an hour, 1.5, maybe even two, the foil starts to engage, the mass is engaged and the stability that come from that really help to create a lot of stability. So on a downwind scenario, you're out in the water and everything's really rough from all the chop. Um, if you just tried to stand up across those swells so your board was constantly rocking like this, forget it. I'm going down. Maybe Kyle Lenny and Austin Kalama aren't, but just about everybody else in the world is. When you turn your board downwind and now you're not rocking side to side as much, more uh, tip to tail, little more stability there. You start moving forward. Like you just said, that creates a lot of stability. And now it's possible if you have the paddle skills, you know? So uh, there's a technique to it and, and mm -hmm. you do learn it, but yeah, it's difficult at first. So let's say that you and I were going out there and you were taking me out first time kind of Maliko, but maybe I a little bit familiar or so on. We would sit down on it paddling out. Is that how we're doing? We would sit on it paddling out and then we hit the wind line and then what then what are you instructing me to do uh stay down on your butt or get on your knees okay. you know sitting too long in either one of those gets a little bit uncomfortable so i usually switch once or twice depending on how far out i go out um once we're in position uh i would say okay turn your board downwind okay maybe get on your knees so that the board can can start to move a little bit just from the wind pushing you. Uh, and then in between swells, jump up to your feet, get your paddle in your hand as quickly as you possibly can and get that paddle on the water and then start to favor that side that the paddle's on a little bit. Start to create a little bit of stability with your paddle. Maybe take a stroke or two. You're gonna create even more stability. Keep a little bit of weight on your toes um because that'll help keep you balanced on the board as soon as you move your weight to your heel you're going over the backside. You're, you're done right so you've got to keep some weight on your toes that'll help stabilize you keep some weight on the paddle use that as a bracing mechanism and then when you see the swell come boom start to chase it with your with your paddle stroke that added um speed will stabilize you quite a bit and allow you to chase the swell now if you miss it Back to the paddle, leaning on it a little bit, stabilizing, waiting for the next opportunity to come. Okay. So, so let me try. And, so as we're, we're paddling out, kind of sitting down or on knees, and then we get out there to the wind line, it's like, okay, let's point down wind. But then we have ground swell. We got wind swell going on, right? Um, it's kind of going, pack, 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 pack. Um, and then, and then am I going, I would go kind of onto my knees just to get a little bit of momentum to go down to get some speed. So I'm not like rocking all over the place. And then exactly. popping to the feet and trying to stay going that way. And then exactly. when you're looking, you're looking like how you normally look at bumps where you're watching kind of in the front or are you actually looking back a little bit? Um, I'm looking back a little bit mm -hmm. uh, in, in one man and traditional stand up downwind. Um, you never look back. I never right. look back. Yep. Um, and I don't look very far back. I just look maybe a swell or two back to see what's coming at me because I'm not actually moving forward much or at all. Um, because, you know, the swells do travel in sets and it is eventually going to come up under me. Um, so I'll look and see what's coming. That'll kind of give me an indication of, all right, here, let's all hands on deck. Let's get ready to go. Get your balance right. Be ready to go. And then always let the first one go. The one that you think you should chase, let it go. It's either the second one behind it or sometimes even the third one. Um, because what you want to do is you want to catch the one that has some steepness to it. And when you do get it, there's still going to be some slope in, in front of you. If you catch the first one, what typically happens while it might get you going, you are instantly going to run into a flat spot because there's always a flat spot in front of a set traveling. So wait for the second or third one probably be going to be the steepest anyway, which means it's going to be the easiest to catch. And then there'll be some slope still to travel down 
once you catch it. And you don't need much, but allow you to get to your feet, get your balance, start pumping, and then immediately turn one way or the other, unless there's still slope in front of you. As long as there's slope in front of you, go down it. Um, mm-hmm. But if there's not, turn left or right, keep pumping, and, and try and find something to, to get you going down. You know, like when um, when we're on the stand-ups doing like downwards or on the canoes, it well, at least for me, it's different because it was as I'm pa- as you're paddling it, the way the bump kind of comes under you, and then the boat the the board nose kind of goes um you know it goes like that, and then it comes comes up like that, and the thing passes, and then it does, and then as it drops like that, then that's when we kind of would would try to catch the swell behind. Is that the same type of move on this, or are we looking doing it different? No, that that's that's pretty much it. Um, right. And I and I tell people, when your nose is at its highest point, that's when you start to attack and catch the swell that's going to be behind you, right? Mm-hmm. So your first couple strokes aren't your hardest, but what you're doing is you're starting to get some forward momentum. I almost like to think of it as pressing the nose into the swell in front of it. You're creating a little bit of tension, right? You're creating a little bit of forward uh, movement so that as you come down into the trough and the board Mm -hmm. levels off you've already established a couple of strokes which means you're establishing a rhythm now as the tail lifts you can increase your stroke rate you've already got a rhythm and that's when you can attack if you wait till the tail starts to lift it takes a stroke or two to get that rhythm going right Mm -hmm. and get into full attack mode whereas if you start here and those first stroke or two are just kind of establishing your rhythm and your stroke. Now, when you get to the flat, you can really start to go. And when the tail lifts all in, you've already created some forward momentum, better chance of catching it. Whereas if you wait till you're at the top of the swell and your, your tail's right near the peak and you're trying to catch it like you would a wave, let's say, um, my experience is a lot of times to swell because their speed, they're moving, will get under you. Mm-hmm. You know, not to set what you're trying to do. You're trying to get yourself up to the same speed or nearly to move with that swell as it's going through the water. So you're putting a lot of weight on the front? Yes, initially a lot of weight on the front. My back foot is forward, say, three to six inches of where it normally would be to keep the board flat on the water and keep mm-hmm. as long a water line as possible. And what you don't want to do is sink the tail and create more drag with the tail air. Uh, area essentially mm-hmm. but the flatter it can be relative to the surface of the water the better it's going to glide the better acceleration you'll have so my front foot's forward a little bit then once i have the speed and, and start to try and lift my back foot will move back a little bit as i start to break free from the surface once i've completely broken free i've moved it back even a little more and it's more into my normal foiling position and i immediately go into my pump to try and keep myself up is your normal foil position for your back foot right on top of the mast, or is it a little bit forward uh, or back? Or right? Yeah, like the, the center of my foot uh, is about the center of the mast, maybe one inch behind the center of the mast. Uh, depends, though. If I'm going really fast, my center of my foot might be at the leading edge of the mast, possibly even slightly in front of it to keep the, uh, the foil from lifting too much and coming up out of the water. So I'm constantly moving my back foot, you know, anywhere from half an inch to two inches, three inches, um, depending upon the speed I'm traveling, how I'm trying to trim the board, stuff like that. You you ever move your feet either forward or back, the front or back foot ever move it like off center, like toward the rails? Uh, Slightly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, When I'm first catching my front foot's definitely offset a bit to the heel side, my my back foot is offset to the toe side. So, uh, you know, relative to the, the center line there, they're, they're kind of angled. As I get going, I bring both of them more into alignment with the center, but they're still probably offset a little bit. Some people offset quite a bit as their normal riding stance. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. You, you know, when you first get up, so when you first paddled out there, you got into position, get up on the knees, kind of get going. Is you are you already are you jumping into your surf stance at that point, or are you kind of still more parallel side to side and then getting going and then moving it in? I'm jumping into probably at least a half surf stance to three quarter surf stance immediately. 
Mm -hmm. and then get myself going. So everything is favoring my paddle side in terms of my weight so that I don't fall over backwards and I'm able to brace with, with my paddle on my front side. Okay. Did, I can't remember if you said on your front foot, as you're starting to paddle for the bump, was your front foot moved forward or only your back foot kind of moved forward? So my front foot is moved forward a little bit, maybe, mm. maybe an inch to two inches forward of my normal riding position along with my back foot to keep the board flatter and glide better initially. And then, then no, as I, no, go as ahead, I go ahead, sorry. water, then I'll move everything back into a foiling position. But initially, yes, both feet are, are further forward. And then the, in the relationship of the nose, like the, the nose to the water, how close are you? Are you sometimes bearing the nose a little bit to kind of keep that nose down or you always keeping the, the nose above the water? I want the level of the nose to be as close as I can get it to the level of the water without going under initially, you know, okay. and then I'm starting to bounce, maybe not on my first stroke, but my second stroke for sure. And so now while it, I don't really think it goes under, or if it does, it's a minor amount. Um, but it's, it's bouncing up above the surface, back down to the surface quite a bit as I start catching paddling and pumping all at the same time. So you're not necessarily accelerating into it like you would on a, um, like a normal surfboard on a wave. You're actually, once you're taking a few, the, the thing, once it, um, so once the bump passes under like this and you, and you start to, your nose starts to dip a bit, you're already doing that kind of pumping move and, and paddle almost like you would even on a wing foil kind of, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. My, my leg pumping, body pumping, um, I start very early on, even though the first one or two might not be too exaggerated. It, it comes back to my philosophy of setting the stroke rhythm, uh, maybe a stroke or two earlier than you need it. Mm -hmm. um, I start the, the bouncing and the pumping with my legs, maybe a stroke or two earlier than I'm going to need the pumping so that when I really need it, I'm already totally engaged to set the rhythm. Now I can really start to exaggerate it as I'm on the verge of catching and coming up. Okay. And then when you're pumping it, are you doing like an uneven, like that kind of porpoisey movement? Or are you doing like more even two foot kind of pumping? And the first one or two is just a bounce kind of okay. maybe more even, but then by the second, third and everything after that. Yeah. Now I'm trying to porpoise much more. So Cause you're just trying Three. to release the water. Uh, release the water, but you're also trying to create thrust with the foil oh. itself to, to get that little bit of burst forward on the downstroke. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then once you're up, you kind of pump, get up, then you're not like a lot of times on the, um, you know, the, the standups or the canoes, you kind of hang out right there in the trough ish. You're kind of making a turn like you would on a wave. Oh yeah. Immediately, yeah. immediately engage the pumping. Figure out the rhythm for that. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's more of a flutter pump. Mm -hmm. um, try and get acceleration as quick as possible. Uh, and then I might open it up a bit and, it, and it's a bigger swoop, let's say. Um, if I've got to go a ways before I find a proper swell to kind of engage with and start sliding down it. Is, is there anything that um, people over 200 210 220 need 200 you know pounds need to consider in this versus somebody lighter in the way that they're approaching it or approaching your boards um well the boards are definitely de designed or there are designs models available to accommodate heavier riders no doubt about it um but i would say use your weight to your advantage be because you have if you're a bigger person uh use that weight throw it down lift it up to create a more dynamic pump mm. um exaggerate that pump through the engagement of your weight and that'll create more thrust with the foil and help get you up out of the water sooner you know it's mm -hmm. easier for a lighter person because if, if we're if if my son's on a gt160 and i'm on a gt160 it's going to lift him out of the water sooner than it will me. Right. It is right. Math of it. So how do I try and minimize that difference? 
a, a more solid pump, a more dynamic pump to create a little more thrust so that my foil can have the speed necessary to lift my weight out of the water. Okay. Okay. Um, was there anything that, that we didn't cover that you're like, dude, I should, we should cover this. No, you've covered some great points, uh, giving me an opportunity to explain a lot of the features on my board and what's going on. I'm sure there's a couple things that, again, like your first time foiling, I'll start to remember <laughs> or to think about after the fact. But uh, I, I think we've covered a lot of really great information. You know, I wonder if you have any tips on like um, handling the board, like outside of the water. Uh, how are you carrying it? Um, maybe maybe especially if you got the bigger boards some things to think about are you fully dismantling a lot of times um you know any kind of tips you might have for that um generally i just take my front wing off and put it in my car and, and the majority of the time i leave my mask attached uh but sometimes um when we're doing downwinders and there's a few of us or whatever to accommodate carrying that number of boards it's easier if we take our masks off um so just for transportation convenience a lot of times i will take my mask off it, given a choice i'd rather not just leave it on um carrying it i'm kind of old school you know carry sort of the fuselage in one hand and the board in the other um but as I'm watching videos of guys getting into the water, out of the water, I'm learning all new techniques. Um, like Tomo, my Japanese buddy, he puts the foil on top of his head with the mask to the side and then kind of supports the board a little bit like that. Or <laughs> Yeah, there's, I've seen some guys that kind of do like a forearm wrap. I, I didn't even completely figure it out, holding the mask with the board on their shoulder or something like that. So, uh, you know, I don't know if one way is ultimately better than the other. I guess I'm more old school in how I do it or how we first did it in the beginning was, you know, the, the mast in one hand and, and mast and paddle, if I'm doing stand up in one hand and uh, holding the foot strap or a handle on the deck of the board with the other hand. Um, but now... <laughs> Uh, you see a lot of the wing guys that have the, I even have them on my board, the handle on the bottom, just in front mm -hmm. of the mat. And you can carry the board with one hand uh, via the handle on the bottom and your wing in, in the other one or just your paddle. And that's kind of cool too. I, I actually ended up liking it better than I thought. But uh, personally, I don't really like the idea of a big hole in the bottom of my board. If there was a big hole in my bottom of the board on any other given day, I'd fix it, get mm -hmm. rid of the hole. But because it serves such a functional purpose uh, for carrying it, it makes a bit of sense. And it's worth, you know, the, the compromise. Like I say, everything a compromise design-wise to, to get one thing, you're giving up a little bit maybe the other, and it comes back to what your priorities are. Um, generally, I don't like holes in the bottom of my board, but because it serves such a, a highly functional purpose, okay, now there's a hole in the bottom of my board. Right. And the purpose is that so you can for winging, you can hold it there and not and have the wing downwind and not have it close to your um, foil. And so exactly. On. Yeah, exactly. It, so how are you doing it then? You're grabbing the front strap, the front strap and then the the um, the, the fuselage. Is that how you're doing it now? Front, front, either the front strap or, you know, a lot of times I'll just make a little webbing handle between okay. the back strap and the front strap and grab that. Um, but the front foot strap is basically just as functional as a little webbing strap. It hardly matters. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so you're using the webbing strap again then, because the, the newer ones that didn't have that on it, um, and just, it's easier to construct. So, but you're using that again? Yeah. I just make my own homemade ones. Okay. Just get a piece of webbing. If you want to do it yourself, just get a piece of webbing, um, fold over the end so that you're going through two layers with your mm -hmm. screw into the insert. And then that way it can't pull off. If you, if you don't fold it, your screw can pull through the end of the we webbing. So as long as you take the ends of the webbing, fold them over, send the screw through two layers, mm -hmm. you're fine. Are you burning a hole or are you, or are you just sending the screw through? I just screw right through. 
Okay. I, I burn the end so it doesn't fray on the very end of the webbing. Mm -hmm. Then fold it under, send the screw right through both layers. You're good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. I might I might Some do that. People don't like the webbing handle, actually. It's kind of in the way, yeah, on the, on the deck. That's what they think, and, and initially that's what I thought too, but after oh. I used it for a while, I'm like, I, I don't even notice it. It's not yeah. in the way at all. So yeah. I tolerate it, but, but most people that haven't used one view it as something that is going to get in the way, but uh, nah, it doesn't really. Okay. But holding the foot strap, your front foot strap is, it, it's, you know, just as functional. Yeah. If you don't want that thing in the way, then whatever, it, does, it doesn't make a big difference. Okay. Are you still doing the, like the paid coaching and the paid um, lessons and so on? Yes. Uh, not as much as I used to because I'm the boards have me so busy that um, any free time I have is really valuable to me. And I'd like to spend it either with my family or on the water. But uh, if I'm not real busy, then yeah, I still really, really enjoy coaching and, and working with people. Um, I just don't have the luxury to have as much time available to it as I used to. Okay. Okay. So then where are the places that people can find like you, your information, so on, either online or offline that you prefer? Um, Instagram's probably the most common place I am, uh, but all my posts go to Facebook. But I, I, I check Facebook sometimes once a week. So yeah. if you do message me or it doesn't seem like I'm there much, I'm not. But I do check it occasionally. Um, or you can go to kalamaperformance.com. Uh, as you mentioned early on, it's a website of very little functionality at this point, but we're working on it, literally working on it uh, right now. So I hope in the next week or two, uh, the very bare bones of a website will be available and we'll keep uh, finishing that. But uh, the kalamaperformance.com does exist. You can email me. And that's how at this point um, we're getting most information out through direct email and, and engaging with people. So, yeah. So just go to the website, kind of the, or Instagram. Yeah. yeah. .com or message me on Instagram. Okay. Okay. Well, Dave, I want to thank you. Um, I know that I asked you to do this on short notice and you've always been like, the best about sharing, you know, your mana'o, your, your knowledge with all of us. Um, I also want to acknowledge you because, you know, this whole stand up and now foiling and so on, it's, you know, I mean, I literally can say this thing has, you know, changed my life for the better. It's gotten me out and doing more exercise. And I know it's done that for a lot of people. And even in the, um, the stand up side, I mean, you were always in there, but then didn't have your own, you know, um, products to sell so much and now you do and I'm super happy about that so I just want to acknowledge you for you know all that you've done for the sport and 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 your aloha for everybody and always sharing your knowledge um, thank you for that yeah you're welcome um, can you see me right now uh, you kind of cut out yeah no king now came back. yeah sorry I got another phone call I really appreciate the kind words um i can do it again right. since now you're now you're what's called i mean i i, I can just do it yeah. again i, I mean as no, long I'm, as everybody I, can see you that's fine uh I, I was just listening um but what i was going to say is is like you said in the beginning it's brought you so much joy and, and fun it's done the exact same things for me i cannot believe at this stage of the game i get to go through this process again like i did with windsurfing like I did with toe surfing, mm -hmm. with stand-up paddling, and now foiling. Uh, it has kept me so motivated and enjoying the ocean as much or more as I ever have. And I've had some incredible experiences and some incredibly fun days. And I feel like my average day of downwind foiling at this point is bringing me as much joy as anything ever has. And maybe that's because I appreciate it now more and I understand how valuable and how rare that is. Yeah. So to, to your point, the amount of joy 
this is bringing me is unbelievable. And with the experience that we've all gone through in the last couple of years with COVID, um, I think I drastically underestimated and underappreciated how valuable that time in the water is to your mental health. Yeah. Something I was barely even aware of, mm -hmm. but with that experience and, and I would imagine like a lot of people getting sucked into those downward spirals from the news and the political going back and forth and all this stuff. Um, it's easy to get sucked into kind of this negative outlook. And when I get in the water and especially when I get out of the water, it's like, yeah, everything's fine. <laughs> I'll be fine. You know, it just is so clear, clearing, clearing your mind, clearing your soul and, and putting a negative or uh, excuse me, putting a positive uh, outlook on everything. And uh, I, yeah, I, I never appreciated how valuable that time in the water was. So I'm super stoked on foiling. It's brought back a, a vigor and a, and a hunger to go stand up paddling and ride waves like that. Um, I've had a lot of neck issues that are starting to allow me to prone surf again. So now I'm getting back on my longboard and have a whole new appreciation for that and level of enjoyment. So just time in the water, regardless of what I'm riding or what I'm doing, um, has become so valuable. And, and I'm at an age now where I realize uh, the, the finish line is somewhere off on the horizon, whereas when, let's say I was in my 20s, 30s, and maybe even 40s, ah, this is never going to end. It, it's always going to be like this. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I didn't appreciate it as much. Um, but I have that, that foresight now to realize that this ride doesn't go forever. So better make the most of it while I can. And uh, that's given me a whole new level of appreciation which has upped my enjoyment because I realized how, how valuable it is now. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you. You're one of the special people out there. That's always, you know, unselfishly giving of your time and in, in, in your efforts. And I'm really happy to see that, you know, this venture is working out really well for you. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I was that 10, 12, 13 year old Grom just, looking at my surf heroes, Jerry Lopez and Buttons and Bertleman and all those guys from the seventies that surfed unbelievable. Man, I, I had first time I met Jerry and I had stars in my eyes. I couldn't say anything, you know, I was just in awe, like, Oh my God, that's him. You know? So I am still inside that Grom that is stoked on surfing, whatever form it is. And, highly appreciative of uh, that information. Jerry was very kind to me mm -hmm. and that made such an, a lasting impression. Um, so I want to make sure I pass that along. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Yeah. Appreciate all your time. Yeah. Evan. Okay. Really fun talking with you. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Please comment, give us a thumbs up and see you next time.